Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Token Post interview. Today we have invited Mr. Miko Matsumura, one of the keynote speakers at our Blockchain Open Forum. Welcome. Yes, good to be here. So to our viewers, could you give a brief introduction about yourself? Sure. I'm a general partner with a crypto investment fund based in Japan called Gumi Cryptos. Mm -hmm. And I'm also a founder of an exchange called Evercoin Exchange. Mm -hmm. So uh, when it comes to Gumi Crypto, you guys are based in Jap Japan, right? Yeah, so Japan is essentially the largest crypto economy in the world. Mm -hmm. More than 55% of fiat currency to Bitcoin happens in JPY, in Japanese yen. So it oh. is really not only the biggest, but it is bigger than everyone else added together. Oh. Uh, USD is about 25% of all of the government currency going into Bitcoin. So Japan is definitely a unique crypto economy. And following that is Korea maybe? Korea is definitely one of the biggest with respect to global crypto exchange volume. Mm -hmm. But even in global crypto exchange volume, Japan is holding at about 38% of global crypto exchange volume. But, but definitely Korea is one of the dominant <sighs> crypto economies in the world. And it's, it's amazing what's happened here. So recently, uh, Gumi Crypto announced to launch $30 million crypto fund starting to assist, well, stating that you will be assist access to the Japanese market. Yes. So Japan is a land infamous for restriction. I'm pretty sure you're, we're well aware of it. Uh, what are the specific services Gumi Crypto would provide? Yes. So we know that not only is Japan an extremely attractive environment, but it is universally accepted that it is hard to do business <laughs> in Japan. It is very hard. Relationships are slow to form in Japan, mm -hmm. but once formed, they're, they're very reliable, right? Mm. And so the advantage that Gumi has is that Gumi is actually a successfully publicly traded game company in Japan mm -hmm. with 850 employees. Mm -hmm. And so having taken Gumi public, that's the company, then we formed this crypto investment fund. So now when we introduce our portfolio companies into Japan, so we invest in the best crypto teams worldwide, we can actually help them with all kinds of things in Japan, business development, we can make introductions to investment groups and syndicates mm -hmm. in Japan, we can help them with marketing, with developer relations, with meetups, we can incubate their office. So, you know, anything to do with expanding your operations mm -hmm. into the largest crypto economy in the world, we can uh, help with. At the moment, the Japanese crypto exchanges are being very conservative with listing new mm -hmm. coins, but we feel that eventually this will relax more and we'll be able to help with that as well. Uh, you mentioned that you guys invest in the best project. So what constitutes a best project in your perspective? Absolutely. So we are hunting for the absolute best teams in the world. When we think about a team, we're really not just looking at any individual, but we're looking at the relationships between the individuals. But we really like experience. Mm -hmm. We like the experience of founders that have returned value to investors through an exit. Mm -hmm. uh, we like domain expertise. So we mm -hmm. really like people who have experience running things. However, we do recognize and honor first-time entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. but in that case, we tend to look for traction. So we tend to look for proof that their business is actually what they say and that it's taking off, right? Uh, but really, to me, experience is, is a wonderful thing. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think a lot of us with grayer hair survived <laughs> kind of the dot-com boom and bust. Yes, of course, you know? yes. And so with these experiences, we have a sense of what it takes. Now, what we don't mind is we don't mind a pairing mm -hmm. of younger and older entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. So for example, if you remember Google, yes. you had this amazing dynamic duo, mm -hmm. right? Of basically <laughs> Larry Page and Sergey Brin, yeah, yeah, yeah. young people. But then you have Eric Schmidt, Oh, he's the uh, OG. Of Correct, <laughs> right? Someone with gray hair, former CTO, former CEO of Novell, former CTO of Sun Microsystems. Yes. Very yes. senior executive, right? So you have this balance. So to me, we really look for teams that can achieve that and can really achieve that kind of mix and balance. But I think experience does matter. Mm -hmm. 
So moving from the, well, moving from Kumi Crypto, uh, you have been in the open source distributed data management business for yes. an, as long as your career. And following that, you founded Evercoin. Yes. Through Evercoin, you plan to achieve a democratic and rewarding system for stakeholders. Absolutely. Exchange wise, how would this be realized? Well, one of the amazing things that I've been exposed to is that it turns out when you study the crypto economy, there are very few individuals that have successfully deployed decentralized peer-to-peer -peer applications in production scale. Mm -hmm. So my co-founder, Talib Ozturk, mm -hmm. he and I worked together on a company called Hazelcast. Mm -hmm. That's Hazel the uh, finance data process, Correct. open source data. Open yes. source in-memory database. Yes. And this product, while it is not a consumer peer-to-peer -peer application, yes. the cluster nodes aggregate in a peer-to-peer -peer fashion, mm -hmm. and it is in production under uh, places like the Apple online store, mm -hmm. and in just about every meaningful high-frequency trading outfit in every meaningful investment bank. Mm -hmm. And so it is a highly, highly production scale deployment of peer-to-peer -peer distributed computing. Mm -hmm. uh, so to me, you know, this is really kind of the DNA of the Evercoin exchange, mm -hmm. you know, and it is the mindset that we're going to use to build ultra high scale applications for mm -hmm. crypto exchange. Mm -hmm. We also come from the roots of open source software. So we're very much about democratization. We're about decentralization. So I think that one of the biggest flaws in exchange is that we are creating new banks and what we're doing is is we're creating custodians mm -hmm. where we're essentially just beaming all of our cryptos into a giant pile so that they can be hacked mm -hmm. right so and we've seen these spectacular hacks recently in korea though unbelievable <laughs> yes i mean you know bitthumb did get hacked less spectacular mm -hmm. so i think it was 30 million usd yes. but even so that is to the people affected, it's meaningful. Of course, of course. Right. Obviously, with with uh, um, CoinCheck, yes. we had almost a half billion USD, and mm -hmm. of course, the grandfather of all exchange hacks, Mt. Gox. <laughs> right. And if you really calculate the damage of the Mt. Gox, like mm -hmm. the custodian has been selling Bitcoin through OTC, but the, it certainly has put a drag on the price. And if you calculate the today value of mm -hmm. Bitcoin of what got hacked out of Mt. Gox, it is absolutely astronomical. So, you know, we have not learned our lesson. And <laughs> to me, you know, Evercoin is based on a principle of non-custodial exchange, mm -hmm. which is the ability to self-custody the way that Satoshi Nakamoto intended, mm -hmm. right? which is that in blockchain-based cryptocurrency, the private key holder is the only owner. Yes, yes. Right? And in the case of something like a centralized model, like, you are no longer the owner. Right? Mm -hmm. You sent your cryptos to who knows where. God knows where, where the server goes, right? over. <laughs> like, you have zero technical recourse. Yes. And if something happens, like, you have no means of reversing it. You probably have almost no legal recourse, mm -hmm. right? Because custody has not been legally defined in crypto. So we have, yes. so to me, you have no technical resource, you have no legal recourse, mm -hmm. so what? Like, you know, <laughs> hope for the best? So I think we're making a huge mistake recreating something that is more centralized mm -hmm. and less regulated than Goldman Sachs, oh. right? So exchanges, <laughs> we're, we're doing something very wrong in exchanges. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to uh, decentralized exchanges, uh, Evercoin is touted as the easiest crypto investment dApp. However, in the Korean market, uh, customers or maybe crypto investors usually shy away from approaching to decentralized exchanges, maybe worrying about the cheap TPS or maybe the interface or maybe uh, service-wise, yeah. FAQs maybe. Uh, it really shies away the investors. And since Evercoin is the one touted as the easiest one, what traits do Evercoin have that contributes such name, like name value? Yes, yeah, so we try to steer people away gently from this naming of 
decentralized exchange versus centralized exchange, mm -hmm. we feel that this distinction is very crude because we can slide things, right? So for example, support, mm -hmm. like is support centralized? Indeed, it is centralized. Because we it's can, coming from a source. Correct. And the reason why we centralize support is we really want to ensure the quality of the support and we want our customers to feel safe mm -hmm. and we want them to know that they're actually talking to people yeah. who can fix their problem, right? <laughs> and we do compensating transactions, we do refund users, we do, mm -hmm. you know, we, we guarantee that what we do is consistent with the values mm -hmm. that are in the blockchain, right? Which is the values of transparency and yes. truth and, you know, so we definitely want to centralize support. The thing that's amazing, you said TPS, mm -hmm. we're actually centralizing, in quotes, the execution, right? Mm -hmm. And the thing that's interesting is if you look at something like Hazelcast, mm -hmm. it's distributed computing, mm -hmm. but it's really all being held in one location. Yes, yes. Which provides for like millions of TPS, so we can really create a distributed computing backend that's highly clusterable, highly performant, mm -hmm. but the location of the compute is not the issue, mm -hmm. right? So earlier when I talked about like, what are we doing with like crypto exchange? <laughs> it's terrible, right, what we're doing. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's not the issue of, oh, the computing is centralized. Like nobody actually cares about where mm -hmm. the computing is happening. To me, the thing that they need never be fooled about is, where are the private keys? Oh, yes. That's yes. the issue. So if you want to talk about decentralizing, that's the one slider that we think is the most meaningful thing, which is you need to follow the money, mm -hmm. right? The fact of computing going everywhere, the fact of like support going everywhere, like you don't need that. What you really need to do is make sure that your money is yours. And that is something that we really treasure and we really like, follow that. It's about who actually owns it, not about who takes care of the backload work when it comes to transaction, right? That's right. And to us, like, that's the reason why we steer people away from this very kind of telegram friendly <laughs> distinction, <laughs> centralized exchange, decentralized yes, yes. exchange, you know. So when people say decentralized exchange, in their minds, they're thinking like ether delta, right? Which oh, is yeah. just like a no man's land, right? Mm -hmm. It's kind of crazy. If you look at the history of exchange, we've already seen an entire life cycle mm -hmm. with music. Music is a digital asset mm -hmm. and it is exchanged. Mm -hmm. And in fact, music is exchanged for fiat, interestingly. Yes, yes. And there are legal and licensing frameworks for music. Mm -hmm. So if you watch the history of music, mm -hmm. It began with a centralized, law-defying exchange oh, called yes, yes. Napster. Right? Yes, yes, yes. So Napster was centralized from a corporate perspective, mm -hmm. but it was also centralized from a server perspective. Mm -hmm. And because of that, the Record Industry Association of America was able to shut them down, mm -hmm. right? So we feel that law-defying exchanges will be shut down. Mm -hmm. I think today that means AML, KYC, <laughs> yes, yes. right? So it means regulatory compliance, right? And if you just trace the history of the music exchanges, there's only one decentralized exchange left, and that is BitTorrent. Mm -hmm. And BitTorrent will not be shut down, even though Discovery mm -hmm. is semi-centralized. Oh. So, for example, like the Pirate Bay <laughs> website, when you discover torrents, you're actually discovering them on a centralized service. Yes, yes, yes. And because discovery is centralized in BitTorrent, mm -hmm. governments have been shutting down Pirate Bay and they've been imprisoning the owners. <laughs> and, you know, so they've been trying to stop it. But not the BitTorrent itself. But BitTorrent itself is an open protocol. Mm -hmm. and the protocol implementation and clients are open source. Mm -hmm. The protocol is unstoppable, mm -hmm. right? But what really happened in music? What really happened in music is even nerds like myself <laughs> are using Spotify. Oh, really? Yes. Right? And, and that is a centralized, mm -hmm. and it is, in fact, a fee-bearing exchange. <laughs> so it's not free. Yes, yes. Right? And to us, that is really what a mature exchange looks like, mm. right? But what you notice is you notice that Spotify is also fully legally
legally compliant. Mm -hmm. They're yes. license compliant. They're doing everything the right way. And the thing that they're focused on is they're focused on the early majority, right? They're not focused on like, hackers and anarchists and like the <laughs> early adopters, they're yes. focused on the early majority. Yes. So in our view, we feel that the evolution of the crypto exchange will move in a similar way, which is that regulatory compliance and early majority adopters mm -hmm. will drive this industry. Because we do need 10 times, we need 500 million wallets. Mm -hmm. So I think you know our focus on support, ease of use, I think will really be and regulatory compliance, I mm -hmm. think, will help with respect to you know educating the market, especially about things like custody. Because if you don't hold your own crypto assets, watch out. <laughs> Thank you for your deep insight on exchange and what constitutes and may be the future direction of decentralized exchanges. So you are one of the keynote speakers of our Blockchain Open Forum. So how's the event so far? Uh, event is amazing. Uh, I'm absolutely enamored of the Korean crypto economy. Mm -hmm. Obviously, some of the most impressive exchanges in the world, some of the most impressive developers. Obviously, we've seen kind of home-bred uh, uh, projects like Icon that oh, have yes, been yes, yes. absolutely like amazing projects. So, mm -hmm. you know, from my vantage point, Korea is special. It's a unique nation and mm -hmm. to have an event like this here i think attracting the best global names in the <laughs> business obviously folks like tim draper yes, and yes. folks like brock pierce <laughs> i think it's a terrific achievement so i think it's a wonderful conference well i hope to see you at our blockchain open forum season two next year 2019 fantastic <laughs> i hope to be here as well Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for tuning in. That was Mr. Miko Matsumura, the general partner of Gumi Crypto and the founder of Evercoin. Thank you for watching.